So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker. Uh, tonight, we've got uh, Dr. Lawrence Shaw, who is the lead historic environment advisor for Forestry England. Lawrence specializes in landscape archaeology, survey and digital heritage, and has a keen interest in how to engage audiences with our discipline. Having worked on many internationally significant projects from Stonehenge, Qatar, Greece and the South Pacific, Lawrence now oversees the management of the rich historic environment found within the 250,000 hectares of the nation's forests. Now, I have to say, I think Lawrence is being really modest because he also manages to fill his time uh, working for Time Team uh, in their new guise. And he also produces the brilliant Career in Ruins podcast. Uh, so I know Lawrence likes to talk. I know he's got lots of really good stories and a great way of presenting archaeology. I also know that Lawrence has a really big challenge in that the forest, uh, nation's forest, 250,000 hectares, is stuffed so full of archaeology, there is no way he could possibly tell us about it all in just 45 minutes. So um, please bear with him. If he doesn't mention your favourite site, uh, um, you can actually go to the forest and get in there and actually have a look at them. But if you do have some favourite sites, please do put them in the chat and we'll see where people are really interested in. But for now, Lawrence, it's over to you um, just to uh, let you know I will be in the background um, and I will be coming back to field questions at the end. Lawrence, thank you. Thank you so much, Neil, for that warm welcome. I'm just going to uh, share my slides and, uh, and say thank you all very much for joining me this evening. And what, what an absolute pleasure it is to be here and to talk to you on this, uh, well, start of spring Thursday evening. So, um, yeah, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, what am I going to touch on? So the, the nation's forests represent a living bridge between uh, our past and our thriving future. And that is my mantra for my job, our organisations, the heritage, the archaeology, the historic environment that we can find in the nation's forests um, that, that is forestry England. And today I'm just going to, I'm going to go over a whole host of different areas and I apologise if it's a bit of a pinball machine at times, but I think there are a number of stories and narratives that are important for us all to understand and appreciate and also explore with regards to the incredible historic environment that you can find in, in trees, woodlands, and forests across England. So what I'm going to do today is just touch on the origins of the forest commission as a whole, how that developed, how it transformed into what is one aspect known today as forestry England, um, our current state of play, and then we're going to go on a bit of a whistle-stop tour on some of the incredible historic environment narratives that can be found in the nation's forests. But as with every great story, we should always start with the beginning. So after the First World War, um, there was the introduction of the Forestry Act in, in 1909. And this was a recognition that our tree woodland cover, woodland cover across Britain was at an all-time low. And the act was, was to look to recover that situation, restore some of the forests and, and woods that had been lost as part of the war efforts. And, and to, to achieve that, the act actually established the Forestry Commission to create state-owned woodlands and forests and promote the development of forestry so that we could have, it, have a secure and manageable um, forest resource with the, with the timber resource. And this image from Botanical website just explains just a slight insight into why timber was such a highly sought after resource during that First World War, whether it's shoring up of trenches, steps, substantial um, timbers going across bridges, um, weapons themselves and ammunition spots. So the use of timber um, to, to deliver such a substantial event across um, Northern Europe at the time was integral and you can sort of understand why the need for the commission and the creation of, of a state owned forest and a sort of a better focus on how we were developing that timber was, was needed. So in 1909 in Eggerford Forest in Devon the first trees were planted and the, the forestry commission began to be. And within the first 10 years of that the public forest estate reached a total of 600,000 acres across 152 forests um, and 138,000 of those acres have been planted um, by organisations across England, Scotland and Wales um, with a focus on fast growing conifers 
um, but also 7,500 hectares of broadleaf trees. And in addition to this, another 54,000 hectares or acres, sorry, of broadleaf of, of are also created, created on private. And this is this is something we see today equally. It's the forest for England, they're growing its own state, and the government are supporting private landowners to support. Um, to to grow sustainable renewables. The nation's forests, Forestry Commission's estate, grew substantially in 1923 when the uh, Royal or the Crown forests were, were handed over. Uh, most of the responsibilities were handed over to the Commission, and this included very, very large areas in the forests of Dean and the New Forest, and this had 120,000 acres of the estate. Um, carrying on through time, and the Second World War came and went and really shone another light on why Britain's survival at the, during the time of war had twice been at least due to their own great timber reserves. Um, and this saw the introduction of another Forestry Act in 1945, which really looked at um, upscaling the amount of, of, of forestry and timber that we've had and how we're managing and maintaining that. Um, and yeah, as a result, it was decided that forestry policy is, is so important that actually a direct minister is, is assigned to be responsible for forestry. As time goes through, and again, I, I, I warn you, this will be a whistle stop tour, but there are a, a, a number of really key events that take place um, across the organization within the commission. So in 1956, just under 50 years since its creation, um, the Britain reached one its millionth acre of planting. Um, in 1963, it started using its first landscape consultants. This is thinking about design and, and landscapes as opposed to just bonking big square blocks of forests, coniferous forests across the landscape. In 1964, the first wildlife officer was, was appointed to think about how we interact with, with nature and, and how we dwell that are. Uh, yeah, forest play, and that was in the new forest. And you know, to check on the top right there, I'm um, afraid his name escapes me right now. And in 1964, unlimited public access was granted to Asian stories. And in 71, we, we moved from hectares or from francas to um, hectares, which is useful from this point on because I'm going to be talking on hectares. Um, events such as Dutch elms disease really shone a light on the impact the pests and diseases can have on our forests. And this is something that we still fight and consider today for on a whole host of different um, um, species. I guess the most obvious one where I am at least is um, ash diver. 1976, two million acres at Plantage. In 1976 as well, first one on forest in the end of the was in the bottom left. As we get into the 80s, we start to think about actually really bottoming out what the impact of modern day forestry is on the landscape. So it's no longer a drive to get trees in the ground. It's no longer a consideration of getting as much metric tonnage of wood as possible, but actually there's a balancing act to be found between forestry and conservation priorities. So focusing predominantly in 1981 is the Wildlife Conservation Act, but this is where we start to see a nice change in how forestry is delivered. And I should say that this isn't this isn't a sneer of what came before. I mean, foresters have been fantastic at identifying archaeology, avoiding it. They, they've got a really good nose for understanding what came before them. But really, this just sets in, in black and white what responsibilities are and, and, and what power should be there. The first archaeological consultant was appointed in 1988 in the form of Professor Peter Bowler. And he was followed by Tim Yarnell, who many of you will know, who was the lead historical advisor for a number of years. And they had the responsibility of identifying and protecting sites and interests. So when, when forests were going in, where, when activities were taking place, they uh, they were about making sure the right processes were, were being delivered and, and sites were being avoided uh, and a process that still takes place today. Other two key dates to, to consider for the organisation as a whole. In 1997, the creation of forest, forest research was established, a really important department which looks at things like climate change, species selection, pest and disease, even social interaction with old forests, and looks at informing decision makings and policy and best practices. And they're still going to on today. But more importantly, in 1999, 
the UK Forestry Standard was introduced. And this is the Bible. I guess it's like National Planning Policy Framework for the Forestry. And this sets out what your essential responsibilities are, what best practice responsibilities are, and then what your requirements are to plant trees, to cut down trees, to manage forests responsibly. responsibly. And there's a whole host of chapters that, that um, foresters have to adhere to. And one of those chapters is a historic environment chapter. And it's, it really looks to set out, um, with it being refreshed just this year, actually, um, it sets, sets out clear instructions of, of what our responsibilities are to avoid, protect and promote the historic environment that can be found in our forest. For and then in, from 2013, we start to see the commission shrink and modify. So in 2013, National Resources Wales takes over the responsibility of the Welsh forests. And in 2019, um, Forestry and Land Scotland take over the Scottish forests. And this is just a bit of a shout out to my colleague, Matt Ritchie. If you haven't visited his website, it's on, the, uh, on uh, Forestry and Land Scotland's archaeology pages. You can do so, there's fantastic resources there from Lego archaeology and, and forestry to some incredible artwork and, and educational materials. But we also see at this point the um, sort of devolution of the commission into different departments with different responsibilities. And I think it's important when we talk about nature's forests and forest in particular, um, to sort of understand what the commission is today. Because everyone talks about the Forestry Commission, but actually on Forestry England, and actually Forestry Commission are the non-ministerial department responsible for protecting expanding and promoting sustainable management of forests and woodlands in Britain. So they are, they are a statutory body, they look at felling license, they give guidance and regulations, they hand out grants. We still have forest research, Britain's, Britain's principal organisation for forestry and trees uh, relating to uh, related to research, providing evidence and scientific services in support of sustainable forests. And then, arguably, in my opinion, we have Forestry England, which is the best arm of the Forestry Commission, because we are curators of the nation's forests. We are the ta taxpayers' money that goes towards supporting um, some of the costs of Forestry England um, are 250,000 hectares of land. And we are large, England's largest land land. land. And we've got over 1,500 forests across England. And we are shaping landscape people, the landscape for people, wildlife and timber. Across that estate, you've got 1,800 miles of trails that you can explore, but also you can get stuck in, provided there's no loggers in there, into our forests and explore them ourselves. And we are supporting England's largest amount of sustainable resources. Um, and we also carry out, and we, we are carers, we are responsible for nationally and sometimes internationally important habitats, wildlife, and historic environment assets. And we're also a, a blooming good recreational offer. If you haven't been to any of our, our main sites where you can go out and explore, try go out, and go out on some segways, um, enjoy some picnic areas, have, go for a wander in the forest and see a gruffalo, then do go and explore because you will enjoy it with, from, from all levels, even getting out on your mountain bikes and you saw our bike. So we are the largest land manager in, in England, and we to, to, to do this, we have six um, evolved uh, districts, North, Yorkshire, Central, West, England, and the South. You know, so they're all quite strange shapes and and um, and whatnot, but all the things you see on the, rap, on the right map there represents um, the forests which we manage. So you can see there's a big old coverage up in the North, in the Dumbland, down in the forest, out in Thetford in the west, down in, in the uh, sorry, Thetford in the east, and uh, in the uh, southwest there, and other cultures that we have been here. So, but a good splattering across the whole country in terms of sites that we have to uh, manage for a whole range of different um, responsibilities. What does what does forestry involve then? So obviously, there's planting of planting of trees, and let me show you these smaller trees being planted at the front here, slightly more uh, established. Uh, coniferous plantations and a, and a well-established forest in the distance there. But also we have to manage, um, we have to consider management and felling and going in with fairly large machinery in this modern day and age, which are relatively low impact, which are informed by the right information, whether that's natural environment or historic environment assets, um, geology, watercourses, sedimentary considerations, 
um, go in there and, and clear the forest. So it could be a clear fell, as the images show, it could be thinning, it could be a whole host of different things. But also so much more, we have considerations about restocking, about wildlife, about climate change, about wet large scale habitat restorations across the country. This one's in the new forest, is a wetland restoration, but we have it taking place in Thetford, in the Forest of Dean, in Kilda, in Yorkshire, all these things that looking at restoring landscapes which perhaps have been negatively impacted by past human activities. Uh, we have beavers, we have fantastic recreation, and we have the timber aspect as well. So loads to consider. How does forestry interact with the historic environment? So obviously I mentioned we have the UK forestry standards, um, which has a whole chapter on the historic environment and what our responsibilities are as a responsible land manager. But also we are audited every year by by so the UK and the whole host of different aspects of the UK forestry standard and make sure that we're we're compliant. So you can stand by word to say we are a uh, responsible and adequate provider of sustainable timber. And that, that's a really important presentation for us to be in that instance. Um, but as a result of that map, which I showed you with all the pink dots, um, we've got a hugely varied landscape um, in terms of types and covers. So we've got uplands, we've got lone heathlands, we've got chalk downlands, we've got sandy and uh, Sort of uh, very dry heaths in the east. We've got incredible gorges in the west, and and a whole host of other different things. But also, we we have deciduous woodland, we have coniferous woodlands, we have some farms, we have uh, ancient woodlands previously or planted ancient woodlands, as well as heathlands, and so much more. So, huge variety of landscape types and color, which influences our archaeological record and the histories that come with that. Um, but also the way that we acquired our land over the last hundred years meant that often we're getting the offcuts or the uh, the uh, the outcasts of landowners. So particularly after the Second World War, when people couldn't afford um, death duties, um, we see very large landowners shelving off um, parts of their land to the commission, whether through nine hundred ninety nine year leases or through per purchases. And often it's the land that they deem to not be that productive. So heathlands, upland, up the moorland, and whatnot. And as a result, these sites tend to have fantastically well-preserved archaeological um, records because all the all the fields which are constantly being being plowed and damaged, um, they're staying as fields, and we're getting the other bits of land. So we've got all these really well-preserved archaeological sites on a whole host of different uh, landscapes and time periods. And actually what happens is that forestry as a land management practice retains and preserves that archaeological record much better than other typical land uses like uh, arable uh, agriculture, for example. And as a result, we've got, I'd argue, the best archaeological record of any land manager in it. And I'm just gonna give you one example of that. So this is in the South Downs. And uh, this red triangle represents a scheduled, a scheduled site. So it's on the national list as a significant archaeological site. And it is down as Romano British Field Systems. It is down as Lynchets. And the best bit that they preserved is this field, which is as previously, it's currently under grazing, but it's previously gone over, gone under the plowing. Now, in the mid uh, 2010s, the South Downs National Park commissioned a LIDAR survey for this area. And for those of you that don't know, LIDAR is an air, airborne remote sensing technique. When lasers leave an aircraft, it can map holes in the tree canopy and record the ground beneath it. And whereas an aerial imagery image, like such as this, which just shows us the top of the trees, um, is limited, so what we can do is remove those trees and create a three D surface of the ground beneath them to, to identify lumps and bumps in archaeology. So, bearing in mind that this. Triangle, red triangle here is a nationally significant monument, the best of the best. We got our LIDAR data back, and actually what it showed us was that A, it's a negligible part of the, a much larger site, but B, the archaeology found in our forests, the field systems, these Romano British Iron, late Iron Age field systems and, and associated infrastructure attached to that, that scheduling, it's far better in our forests than it is in that arable field and, and what, what's been in that.
effectively. And that forest is an active forest. It's been thinned, it's been felled, it's had traditional approaches to forest management take place, but that archaeology survives and is maintained and is recorded and is in the best state compared to the rest of the area. And, and so within our woodland, we've got a huge variety of different historic environment features. We have buried archaeological deposits and features such as uh, Rob here excavating the first World War trench in Sherwood. Um, we have earthworks, lumps and bumps, um, which is what I call the bread and butter um, archaeology historic environment in forests. So this is a lovely moated site in Thetford, um, as a medieval moated site, which survives beautifully on the land. Um, we have buildings, historic buildings and structures. Um, King's House in, in uh, Lindhurst and New Forest are is an old royal hunting lodge, um, sort of dating all the way back to, to medieval, but also a big Elizabethan extension. That's our headquarters in the south, but we have also beautiful warring buildings in the middle of our forest, packed to medieval relic warrens, and, and far more. We have individual individual finds which pop up. This is a unexpected uh, finds for the uh, first thing, um, Bronze Age Axe, uh, Bronze Age Axe, uh, found in Eastern England. Um, so little bits hidden away that we're not expecting and that we'll get unearthed now and again. Um, veteran trees, which can tell us incredible stories from evidence of carving and coppicing, really big, beautiful trees attributed or assigned for shipbuilding, for example, in the forest of Dean and the new forest, which don't, don't quite make the cut, which survive hidden in our forest today and tell us the uh, story. But also we have cultural heritage coming out of our ears. Places like the New Forest and the Forest of Dean, which still see commoning, which see free mining, which still have a verderer's port, which dates back to the Normans. Um, and things like the, the horses, which are what I've seen to be wild animals in the New Forest and the Forest of Dean. They are the architects of this landscape. They created the really significant natural environments that are found there, but they were put there as a result of a decision that William the Conqueror made. So um, we've got all the heritage archaeology historic environment that we could ever want on the lake state. And just to get to, to quantify that a bit, 882 listed buildings, which vary from milestones to substantial um and um, lodges, 752 scheduled monuments, that's around about 3% of the uh, the listings of, of the country. Uh, world, we we cross three world heritage sites. We we'll have have sites in three world heritage sites. Loads of conservation areas, twenty eight registered parks and gardens, at least one registered battlefield, but maybe a second linked to the Battle of Hastings yet to be proven. Um, protected military remains and of aircraft. We've got plenty of those tracked across the RSA, and we've got close to uh, one thousand, a hundred thousand even. Undesignated sites and monuments found across our 250,000. So, we've got a lot of great things. And to so kind of just formalize it a little bit, so these are just our designated sites, the scheduled monuments or listed buildings. And the, the dots represent their, their spread. And I'd argue it's not a perfect representation because our central district has only got nine or, or 23 or something like that uh, scheduled monuments, which probably isn't. Um, an accurate representation of the incredible heritage found in our forest there. But it gives you a taste of the spread of our scheduled monuments and listed buildings. And then we start, to, we can start to delve into that a bit. So of the 750 of we've got 424 are from the Bronze Age. And we have a substantial amount linked to religious and ritual and funeral, religious ritual and funerary activities. Uh, burial mounds, 443. Uh, but also a whole host of different things, whether that's um, um, things associated with domestic um, dwellings, defence, agriculture, and subsistence and monuments, um, as well as yeah, simple things like milestones, all the way up to huge things like hillfort settlements and and many other things. So hopefully that gives you a, a taste of the breadth and of of heritage that we have on our estate just from scheduled monuments. That's just the 750 uh, designated uh, scheduled sites. There are around a thousand, just like shy of a thousand designated 
sites for fell concrete, of which we then on top of that have a hundred thousand other known sites as well. So if this is just looking at our designated sites, you can probably imagine how much more there is to add to it to, um, and the process. So what I'd like to do, and, and Neil mentioned, I, and I, I think it's a, I've touched on it, our estate, our portfolio of, in terms of the archaeological um, remains found on and historical remains found on our estate is vast. And I, it's, it's been so hard once I was asked to give this presentation today to identify what to focus on and what to share with you. So I'm going to take you on a bit of an archaeological um, journey and just pulling out some of the different features and sites. Unfortunately, I haven't got time to go into any details, but hopefully what this will do is give you an idea of to go out and look for your local forestry on the site, look up some of these sites that I mentioned, go and explore and come and enjoy our forests for yourselves and look out for the lumps and bumps, the veteran trees, um, the buildings and all the other things that make our forests so special. So, Apologies, I'm going to jump jump home whole time periods. So I'm going to be quite vague and broad with my descriptions, but hopefully it's the start of the ten that, that really gets to your interest in what can be found in the nation's forests. So we'll start off with the Paleolithic, and arguably two or three of my favourite sites in terms of wow factors and significance, and they they're both the opposite sides of of the country. And the first one is at Linford Water. So Linford Water was once a, a quarry site, an arrogant um, gravel sands site in, in Thetford. And after it had been um, excavated, it was handed over to us as to create the forest and a, 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 a recreation area. But during the extraction of those um, of that gravel, the archaeologists found very large spread of block dark material, and within that material, they found a number of remains of processed and butchered and killed mammoths, and um, many of which had their legs and things. They had they almost forced into this but this darker green material and then processed them and the decent stuff taken away. But also they found within this material the actual uh, artifacts that were being used by these individuals um, at the time of the the, the capturing and killing of the, these mammoths. So. Just in just basically in the background where this light of vegetation is identified is where these mammoths were excavated and these tools were found. Um, and you'd never know it's very it's just a water course, but a water body, but yeah, tons of thousands of years ago, um, we're looking at mammoths walking through those through that end. Across the other side of the country in the Y Valley, well, we have two incredible caves that um called Merlin's caves. Merlin's Cave, which is here on the left, and King Arthur's Cave, which is here on the right. And both of these have evidence, they've been excavated, have evidence of really early um, flora and fauna. So in, in Merlin's Cave, there's evidence of cave bears and, and hyenas. Um, but also in King Arthur's Cave, there's evidence um, of the earliest dates of human presence of British Isles, so around 15 to 14,000 years ago. Just Incredible, and we can just see a bit of a plan the sort of dendritic nature of the artist cave and all the different, different little chambers. Um, and if you wanted to look at that in more detail, you can find that on the front of England and um, spectacular thing. So, I'm going to jump the Mesolithic. Um, we do have Mes Mesolithic sites, but as with the Mesolithic, Mesolithic effect, it's a bit patchy and largely just thin scattered. So, I, I'm afraid I don't have any standout Mesolithic sites. In, to, uh, to talk to you about this evening, but I do have some incredible Neolithic sites. Um, as most of us will associate with the Neolithic, we have a number, several um, Neolithic long barrows across the country, which are these sort of funerary mounds, long, long mounds with ditches excavated either side, placed up in the middle and up there with, with two teeth. In the tomb or anything else in, in the middle there. And they, they vary in from size and shape across the country, but they are lovely things. And they're, they're sitting there hidden, undisturbed in many of our forests. Um, and these are just some of the LIDAR images you, you can get from the environment you can see guys. So a mound here with a ditch, ditch man here with a ditch, and a ditch, and a very long mound here with uh, filled in that 
bit to death. And you've got to love. You don't want them in a bit on Barry. It's pretty iconic from the time period, and, and we've got a few of them to look after. But really, I'd argue they're not our best in the site. And I'll tell you why. Because this is our best Neolithic site. This is one of two Neolithic pits and moments that we have in Yorkshire in our forest, which are just spec. These are big, long, long linear um, features that are often going on the ridges, in, at least in Yorkshire. Huge pits around these, you're looking around eight metres in diameter, regularly spaced. Um, this particular one runs for um, several hundred meters, and then you have another one that, um, even slightly longer in our forests to the northwest of this site. Um, unsure what their purpose is for. It could be for water capture, it could be for delineation of boundaries. Um, you can sort of see the pitting in this uh, drone based structure from ancient image running down the middle here with an, an earth bank running along. It's Western Edge, but just spectacular and just an insight into this is this is hard stone. So you're looking at um, substantial stone geology. It's not chalk. Sure. So to organise people to dig this man, many pits and um, along such a substantial length of, of area demonstrates real um, power and coordination skills and uh, in a time period that. Um, it's really only just coming into to that sort of for people to ability to be able to be in the position to to organise that and coordinate that. It's a lovely testimony to that society. More interestingly, as well, um, the scheduling itself stops at this road because there's a, a, a the rest of its arable fields for all the eye can see from the south, so it's being just being lost and ploughed out and no longer visible. So. We've got a fantastic record of that one running running through our forest. So we keep it clear. We planted um, oak trees all the way along it, so we know where that 20 meter boundary of protection is for that site. And um, it's there for people to go and enjoy and explore and build and find. Jumping into the Bronze Age, then, we've already touched on the fact that the Bronze Age is our most prevalent time period. And we've got everything from settlements, stone circles, rock art burial mounds or barrows, and we've got westwards, which I'll touch on in its own right moment. But really, in terms of our archaeological record across the entire estate, it's the Bronze Age burial mounds that really stand out. And there's two regions that really, really fill that um, portfolio up, and that's the New Forest, and that's the South Downs. So we've got 443 burial mounds across the estate. Some of those are Neolithic, but only a handful of them. Um, and we've got 449 Bronze Age sites of six days. This is a beautiful, you'll see a lot of these drawings um, throughout the, the uh, presentation. This is a lovely um, sketch of some barrows found at, at um, Hilltop in the New Forest. And um, this lower one here has been turned into a right range at late day, but lovely barrow group. I mean, the sort of things we often find, certainly in the New Forest people, but in our forests as well. But really, the greatest barrows are, if you love your Bronze Age archaeology, you've got to get yourself down to Dartmoor, to Fernworthy, and to Belleville, where we've got some of the most incredible Bronze Age archaeology that you'll ever see. So whether it's Belleville with this lovely Rosetta style um, enclosure uh, with round houses found throughout, whether it's this stone road um, with just behind the camera here. At Fernworthy, whether it's a Kiston and, co and ceremonial complex at Belova, or whether it's Tractorines um, at Belova as well, with um, a series of roundhouses that are going to be able to make out in the pictures there. And if you want well preserved, incredible Bronze Age landscapes, you want to head to our forests, you want to look at the sites that the foresters back in the 50s identified, didn't plant on, avoided, and uh, are just sitting there, well looked after, maintained. For anyone to go and enjoy and appreciate. You've even got the look at these incredible curved bronze and round houses that just sit in our forests, maintained with the outer wall. You're looking at about over a metre thick wall at the end of an entry. But I guess our biggest Bronze Age headline is Westwards, where we've got the Sarsen stone, the Sarsen um, outcrop, incredible Sarsen histories that go all the way through to um, 
the Victorian period, but more recently, researchers at Brighton University, Bournemouth University, and people like Peter Whitaker um, have been working and looking at um, the origins of the Stonehenge sarsens. And actually, what they've done with chemical analysis is identify a comparable match to the sarsens that are found scattered in the westwards in our forests in Marlborough. So we pretty confidently, confidently say that our, our wood was the quarry site to um to Stonehenge. Now I'm not sure we've ever received the bill for that 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 stone bill from English Heritage. So we might be sending them a uh, a bill from a debt similar you know, on April Fools or something like that. But an amazing, amazing link to an internationally significant site. Going to the Iron Age, we start to see fantastic archaeology again. Hill forts is Hill forts are the only monument type that we see in every single district that we, that we manage. We have Broad Iron Age square barrows, we have Iron Age industry, and we have Iron Age banjo enclosures. So this is one of our many hill forts, tens of hill forts that we have across our state. Probably one of the only ones that are found in open lands. Um, this is at Wooler Hill Fort up in Northumberland. And you can see it's a multi valley hill fort with an entrance here with internal divisions. And there was once a Victorian golf course up here that we thought maybe we should remove that and restore it to its former iron age glory. Um, up in Wycombe Forest in Yorkshire, we have some probably my favourite archaeological sites in the country. And then they are iron age square burrows. So on this map, you can see on the left here, every square mark you can see in pink represents. An Iron Age square barrow, scheduled Iron Age square barrows. These are burial mounds with the clues in the name. They're square as opposed to round. They're much smaller, about four meters in diameter. And often the association is with the ditch rather than the mound in the middle. But this is some of the densest population of Iron Age square barrows in the country. And we've got many more in the surrounding forests as well. Just incredible monuments in their own rights. But also in southern England, these are just two. We've got a handful of surviving Iron Age banjo and they just leave the Middle Iron Age. Um, they are thought to be inhabitation sites, and people like Miles Russell in Bournemouth University are digging these um, in Dorset, but this is in uh, Hampshire, this one, we've opened Mitchell Dever and Itchen. Um, you've got a bank, traditionally a, a bank on the outside and a ditch on the inside. So, whilst there's evidence of habitation, it's also thought to be for retaining livestock and things like that, drove way into it. And the reason they call Bantry is because they look like Bantry in their design. Right. But incredible monuments and they just sit there, normally traditionally ploughed out, lost um, by, by agriculture, but in our forests, sitting there as extant earthworks, looking fantastic in the light of day to day and on the bottom. Um, my final iron age that I love is the Warm Cliff, and that is because it's a late iron age, early, early Romano British um, quern manufacturing sites. So it's this gripstone, beautiful area to rock climb. But as, as you climb and walk around the area, there's potential to find hundreds of these unfinished uh, beehive quern stones. So you can see the roughly hewn edges of this circular bottom that would have been upside down the other way, that would have been the base of about 50 centimetre tall beehive shaped quern stone. Um, and that's just sitting there upside down. And we've got evidence of the quarrying bays of the unfinished roughly hewn uh, things just littered across this landscape. It's just like stepping back, like they like, like they walked away yesterday and stepping back in time to see what, what they all do. The Roman period again represents a huge um, sort of uh, record in our in our um historic environment records. We have a huge presence. We've got everything from uh, mines to bridges. To pottery productions in New Forest, Savannah, and Alice Hole. We have Roman roads, we have farm sheds, and we even have villas. Um, here are just some of the key sites that we have for, uh, not even the key sites, but it's just one of the many, some of the many sites. This is Hawks, uh, the Hawks in the Lake District. You can roughly make out the outer bank in the distance here of this extended Romano British farmstead in a saddle in the middle of nowhere in the Lake District. This is again is, is a um, a uh, fortified settlement in Ennerdale in the Lake District, which is being eroded away by a river south here. In Northumberland here, we have uh, another square, squarish, sub-rectangular um, farmstead. Um, we have Sparkshot Roman Villa, 
in one of our flares in New Hampshire. And if, if you happen to stumble across the right place in Alice Holt, the New Forest, or in um, Savanac, then you will find room between litter and the floors there as well. So we've got incredible room archaeology across the state. Jumping into the Saxon periods, we have a number of these modern daily ring works, some of them really elaborate, like this one in the South Downs. But also we have a number of dikes um, across our state, our state, the biggest and most obvious being office dikes. So the old Saxon boundary between Wales and Britain, or Wales and England, excuse me. And arguably along that national walking trail, we've got one of the best views in terms of going down into the valley there and seeing. It's a pretty significant archaeology, which I won't promote too much because it's not on our estate. But if you go to Devil's Pulpit on our estate, you'll see that much better than you would standing down there and by that puppy. The Norman period, we've got two of the best Norman landscapes that are still living cultural heritage today in the form of Forest Dean and the New Forest. We still have two Verderers Halls. Verderers are uh, people that were appointed originally by William the Conqueror to manage and look after the um the these these common lands on um, in terms of ensuring hunting took well, was looked after predominantly at, at, at first, but now these guys represent commoners and support the, the traditional approach of commoning, which is ponies, cattle, sheep, pigs, whatever it is that they turn out in these forests. Um, so if you go to the Verderous Hall um in the Forest of D, you can actually have your breakfast in the hotel there when, when it's not being used as a uh, Verderous Hall, when the, the new forest one is just in favor as well. It's the original, it's, it's close to the original as you're going to get. It's a proper medieval building attached to the side of our offices at King's House, just like that. Then we move into medieval period, and we've got so much, so much across our state from Royal Hunting Forest and Associated Infrastructure, Rabbit Warrening, Ennerdale, one of the best preserved upland farming sites in the country. Uh, contested borders and glassworks. And, and again, these are just some of the things you can find, whether it's warning houses and buildings and lodges in Beckford, warning walls in warning walls in um, Dolby Forest, and even capture pits, which have been turned into artwork, rather, rather morbid artworks. Um, and then sort of um, vassal sites, these descend, defended farmsteads in North Northumberland, where farmers were looking to scrape out a living, but not being raided by uh, Scottish raiders, and then this beautiful medieval longhouse in Ennerdale Hill, um, the, the, the surviving Canada. Into the post medieval period, we, we have big Gothic houses like we have here in the Peak District. Um, Industrial Revolution, a lot of the land that was um, lost, I talked about bad land being handed over to the Commission, a lot of the industrial land was handed over to us after it was no longer of use. We get, we've got this particular chimney links in Cornwall linked to a silver mine, which is thought to be attached to the uh, person behind the idea of um, pole dark, but the individual that, that set out the story of pole dark. We have um, Dark Hill Ironworks here, which is the birthplace of modern steel. But we also have the deputy gabler who's still appointed today um, to understand, under, oversee all the mines in the forest and everything that comes with extraction. And this is an appointment of an appointment that's been in place since the 1800s. And we still have that person. This is Dan Howes. And this is Dan Howes' father, um, Mike, who is a free miner, who's still undertaking coal mining extraction in the forest of Dean today. And you can get an idea of the role of timber just in mining of the props and lintels which are holding up Mike's um, incredible um, mine, which has been uh, still open and being processed by him and his mate Phil today. Also, we have trees underground in the forest of Dean that might. So, we, not only do we look after trees above ground, this is a fossilized tree in the roof of Mike's beautiful uh, mine. So, trees coming out of our ears. We have 28 registered parks and gardens, which are often a bit bitty and we never have the house, but we have the stories that come with them. So, we have sites that have Mott and Bailey's in the middle of them, one of which in Nottinghamshire is thought to be the house that once belonged to the, the Dean Sheriff of Nottingham. We have other sites like Latimer Park, which was owned by the Yale family, and Yale University runs the oldest school, um, the oldest continuous professional graduate school in America, which is the forestry. 
Um, and loads more stories attached to our parks and gardens. But also we have the National Pine Eatum at Bedgebury, which was set up to remove pines and look at how we grow pines but away from the smog of London a hundred years ago next year it was set up. Um, and we have the National Arboretum in Western Burt, which is just the best place that we have in terms of the offer. You can go, you can get a cup of tea, you can go and explore this incredible um, arboretum of all the different, you know, 2,500 different trees that are found in, in that arboretum. And uh, this lovely view of, um, in, in the, it's part of a design park and garden made by the, the Holfords, and that's their house that you can see down our avenue. More time, I know I'm going to rattle through my last few slides on the end place, I promise. But we, we have a huge war presence from whether it's the land being taken from us in the Second World War and repurposed to um to just um us acquiring the land afterwards. But we have um rocket launchers linked to V2 rockets and whatnot up the north, um first world war training areas in central England, hidden military bunkers in near Salisbury and Huge gun batteries on the Isle of Wight, but we also have an incredible um, designated heritage. The biggest bomb we've ever dropped on ourselves in the form of Grand Slam and Tallboy were dropped in the New Forest, and that's found on our heat rings along Hampton Reef. Um, and you can go and visit that area today. But also, we go full circle. So this is Sherwood Pines. This is LIDAR data of the archaeology hidden beneath our trees in Sherwood Pines. And what we have hidden there is over 60 kilometers of incredibly well preserved First World War training trenches associated with Pipstone Camp. Now I'd, go, I'd argue some of the best preserved training trenches across the country, maybe only comparable to that seen in um, our Ministry, Ministry of Defence land, but incredible nonetheless. And this only survives because of the trees that have been placed over it. And those trees are only there because of the men who trained there and won the First World War, but also with timber that was used to facilitate that winning in the First World War and then the creation of the Just incredible narrative. And those of you that are interested particularly in this site, they will project with Nottingham County Council, Forestry England, Operation Nightingale, Volunteers and Time Team. Well, we excavated a number of the features identified in that library and that will be coming out but on, at the end of the Festival of Archaeology, the last Sunday, to commemorate the 110th anniversary of the start of the First World War. Leave our own landscape there, legacies, things like the creation of Kilda Forest, Kilda Village, Kilda Reservoir in Northumberland, largest man made forest in Western Europe, as, and that's ours in terms of the commission, that's a nation's forest. Um, and it's not alone in terms of creating populations and Roots and local heritage and forestry heritage and wanting them in new places as the commission grows and is established across the country. And we're still growing today. We are still undertaking with the creation today. We're growing about 500 hectares a year. And in the last two years, we've inherited some incredible archaeological sites to add to our stories. We, we've had areas in a, in a previously arable field. Which we've undertaken surveys and identified this beautiful iron age enclosure with roundhouses and associated parts in the middle. This has been removed from planning now, but we'll sit in open ground, ground that will be protected for hopefully hundreds of years to come when we're no longer enduring any damage from plowing, and certainly not from us. We've also got previously excavated growing villains which have been lost and forgotten. You can still see the walls of those 1970s excavations here. And we've got a lovely new early metalworking site that's come under our protection as well. So we are growing our archaeological assets in register as well as we're growing the nation's growth. And I'm coming to the end now, but just to say the Forestry Commission is just over 100 years old, but we've got 300,000 years of stories, and we do our best to try and incorporate that in our offer, whether it's interpretation, whether it's naming cycle tra trails after important regional sort of characters, whether it's designing art installations, creating all histories and sharing them, digital interactions, um, reconstructed First World War trenches for people to explore and learn about, or even just putting things in our mirrors in our local toilets. I'm not sure if Roman properties have been made in that toilet. I think it was made at Alice Holt, where the toilet was in the field. But we try and bring our history to life wherever we can and share our stories. And I, I've been rattling them for an awful long time, so I will leave it there just to say thank you so much for listening. Do get out and explore our forests. Do go and learn about the incredible things we've got. And um, 
yeah, enjoy it. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Uh, I've got a, a stash of questions for you. Uh, I'm going to try and group them together in, in sort of themes. So there's there's one about the actual management and the creation of the forest, and then there's about, a bit about stuff, and then there's a bit about future management, and then some nice, wonderful, eclectic messages from the end. Just at the beginning there, when you had the slide of the very first planting, you actually said 1909. Did you mean 1919? Yes. Yes. So, so we are right. So the Forestry yeah. Commission dates from 1919. Yeah, right, yeah, and I know that we know that that's what 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 you you meant, which is which is which is fantastic. Okay, so how how did the land first come into the ownership of the Forestry Commission? Was it primarily via compulsory purchase? This is from very Paul. rare not compulsory purchase. It, it, it was acquisition. So often it was either through death duty. So as I mentioned in the talk, we we were we were acquiring land. So it was very. As I understand, it, very little compulsory purchase. There's often large landowners that were lobbied by Parliament, for example, to help, well, help out the creation of the commission, give them a bit of your land. Also, an awful lot of our land is uh, certainly in southern England is, is uh, leaseholds. So we get these 999 year leases. So rather than people perhaps are struggling at time to pay death duties, they, in, in lieu of death duties, they give us very long loans of, of that state. And I think that they Ancestors might inherit it back in the same way as time, but really varied. I mean, at, at present, we are we, we are receiving from money from DEPRA and the government to grow the donations for us. And as I said, we are looking at land sales and we are purchasing land where possible to establish. Brilliant, which neatly goes on to um, the next sort of set of questions I've got for you. So, Jill asks, how do you protect these sites from reseeding? Uh, from the surrounding trees, so obviously we're we're in a forest. The forest wants to regenerate. What what's the strategies for looking after the archaeology in that context? Great question, and it's a, it's a never ending battle, Jim. <laughs> but um, it's about so we have to we we adhere to something called the protocol for the care of the government and the state, and we get uh, reviewed on this biannually. So we've just received our scores for this year, and uh, we've got a high score. Actually, we've had to jump jump from seventy eight percent to ninety percent in our score, and that's largely to do with how we manage these sites. And what we have to do is have management plans for every single one of our seven hundred and fifty odd Sheffield monuments, um, and they tend to last for five years. And within that, we have very clear prescriptions on what what we need to do with that. So those prescriptions could be monitor. They could be undertake clearance work and that clearance work can vary from going out with teams of some of the most important people in our organizations in the form of volunteers it could be paying on large sites for gangs to come in with, with machineries to cut more substantial things down or things that volunteers shouldn't be cutting down um or in some instances where they're really tricky sites for, for example we've got a site in Ware and Forest at the moment which is covered in gorse and we've been using something called a flail box someone with a remote control flailer you can get into sites where a tractor can't get to, or where a tractor would damage a site, but actually clear the, some of the regeneration that we start to see on these sites. But it, it is a never-ending battle, but we, as a resource land manager, to keep on top of that. Brilliant. Okay. Next, I've, I've got a question from, from Beth, exploring the idea that actually the establishment of our nation's forests was actually about establishing tree farms. Um, but that's not really the case of what we're doing anymore, is it? And she would like to hear more about what are the plans that you're looking to explore in terms of restoration and regeneration? Yeah, absolutely. So um, if, you, if you search Forestry England grow, Growing the Future, you can sort of see our strategies as an organisation on where we're going. And what, what you'll see is, as, as we see, see through history, as the archaeological record shows us as well, is a change in policy and appreciation and responsibility to how we perceive our land and how we manage our land. And actually what we're seeing is a lot of restoration of things like the like areas that were perhaps previously ancient woodland, which saw plantations take, take place in them, areas where they were heathland, where we're actually, where am I mentioned, like Thetford, like the New Forest, where we're restoring heathland from the plantation. Um, um, also, where priorities perhaps are linked to rare species and rare butterflies and rare, rare birds. And so there's this big juggling 
at the band, but what, what's lovely, and one of the things I'm most proud about about the organisation that I work for is that we aren't driven by making loads of money from trees there. We aren't a big tree farm. We are looking at a holistic approach to, uh, of the largest land land in the UN, to get the best for people, for wildlife, for this sort of environment, and to also make enough income that makes us sort of um, financially viable as well. So we, we I think at, at present we're ten percent funded by the government, and um, we, we find the rest of it is also by sales and grants and, and and tree sales. And that 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 tree sales, those tree sales aren't about planting more trees; they're about improving the land that we have and perhaps restoring some of the mistakes that the earlier foresters made. We made them because they were driven by completely different priorities in the form of post-war activities and all the rest. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, one of the things you've shown is just how much stuff survives in our forests. So actually, in the sense they've created their own, um, uh, you know, sort of network or heritage ecosystem of of of, of sites. Um, so here's a question again. This is about we're just exploring a bit about actual woodland and woodland management and what it actually means. And I know you're not one of the uh, Forestry England's foresters. You are their heritage specialist. So but we're going to go with this one anyway. Uh, so this is someone who lives in Suffolk who's surrounded by woodland that's been created by humans. Uh, and they just want to know, what's your take on pine woodland now being removed from heathland? Um, I think it, it's, it's always going to come down to site-specific things, but I think with regards to the environment we're in, with climate change, uh, with pesticide diseases, with the crisis that comes around nature and uh, the loss of some of those species that we are, are seeing, I think, if, if you if any of those things were drivers to remove and plant trees in those in those regions, um, and if any if it's something can benefit things we have here and now, I will always see that as being a beneficial thing. Too. But I come from a very um, so I don't know if you've it less position, but it's not my decision. But I can just inform on what we're what we're but What I love actually, and what 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 we are looking at is the is a landscape scale legacy. And what we always see in the record, whether it's through historic maps, whether it's through LIDAR, or whether it's the forest that we see today, is it's a decision that was made 15, 30, 100 years ago. It's a big, broad time scale landscape shaping. And whether we're planting new forests now or whether we're removing old forests from the future, I think what that will do is leave a pretty positive uh, reflection of our. Uh, our ambitions for the future, whether that's wildlife, whether that's climate change, or what's carbon capture. Yeah, sorry, we, you just dropped out of, of the sound a little bit there, Lawrence. But um, the next next question is linked. How do you feel about the reintroduction of beavers? Love them. Love them. And I've got a huge potential to, uh, to... Often we want to think about how we can integrate the natural environment with our historic environment. And often we've got unused water bodies, ponds, mill ponds, things like that in our forests, which might lend themselves to being repurposed as beaver homes. But yeah, I think they're fantastic. Okay, right. Um, we're, we're, questions are still coming, so I'm going to try and go through these ones quite quickly. So we're, we're, you're allowed quick answers, but this is a really important one. So Stephen says he's been finding bits of quern, Roman pottery, ironworking material uprooted by animal activity or maybe forestry operations. He's reported it to one of the Portable Antiquities Find Liaison Officers, but is there a way to report it directly to Forestry England? Absolutely. So um, you can go on our contact us page um, and they'll give you, depending on where you are in the country, it'll give you your region and then um, you, can, you can get to contact us or you can just email me lawrence.shore at forestryengland.uk. OK, everyone heard that here. Just email Lawrence Shaw, um, which is brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. OK, so... Um, next question asks, where are the three World Heritage Sites you mentioned earlier? It's Cornwall, it is the Stonehenge in 83, and it is, um, it is Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian's Wall, of course. Excellent. That is, that is really good. OK, so here's a little bit of another technical question. This is about Jingleby Howe, uh, the double pit alignment. I just... Uh, Brilliant, fantastic site. And the question is, do you think they might have been mining following a vein or an ore? Yeah, I, I'm no expert in this. But someone like Stuart Ainsworth, I've talked to you about this. He's done a lot of studies on them with um, Al, uh, I forget his surname. 
at Oswald. The and that's the one. Um, and they, they're, they, they're taken and they're more delineations, their landscape features. Yeah. Um, but um, as I understand, there isn't much mineral requirements for, for that, that, that particular area, that particular feature. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, in a sense, they follow the, they're, they're too straight, they're too perfect in many ways, they're too considered. If you're going for an extraction and ore, you're a little bit messier, but these things are really precise in what they're actually yeah. doing, uh, which is why we think they probably are a, a boundary marker, or people even thought they might have had posts standing up in them in some way or whatsoever. That's, that's absolutely fantastic. Okay, so um, what I've got now, there's a really lovely question. Um, well, these are slightly too related. One is about LIDAR, really, really important. How much of the estate is covered by LIDAR? Everywhere except um, my favourite and most important forest in, in uh, Yorkshire, so Dolby and Wycombe. There's a big old radar up there that points oh, yes, towards, um, towards the west. I'm not sure why it's constantly... Uh, sorry, east. I'm not sure why it's always constantly pointing east at the moment, but as a result, we can't, we don't have coverage for those those forests. But otherwise, we've got the Environment Agency um, is their their data coverage is even revolutionary to our side. So. That's right. So you're you're obviously meaning filing Dales more uh, early detection uh, radar site. Yes, clearly not going to let us fly anything around there with nice bits of lidar. Okay, thank you. That was brilliant. And then the, this question is, is when you've got multiple layers of heritage, so Victorian golf course over the top of a uh, hill fort, um, who and how is it decided about which period should be preserved or restored or or kept? Yeah, I, so I, I, I was a bit flippant with that golf, golf club in that it was already a few removed before we inherited the site. But, um, but that will generally come down to historic England in terms of scheduling and what they deem to be part of the site's narrative and, and what's preserved. And often you'll find that things like that will be incorporated in the scheduling and sometimes they will be excluded from the scheduling. But generally as a land manager, if it's a historic site and it's, it's a monument, unless there's a greater good for it to be lost and modified, we will detect it, we will preserve it and we will avoid it. Brilliant. Okay, right. There's just a couple of little uh, uh, questions before the the two contentious questions at the end that I'm going to throw to you, but and I've not asked them by the way. I will just put that out now. Okay, <laughs> this is lovely. Will you be involved in the upcoming two year project at Sutton Who? I think that's a reference to Time Team, Lawrence. I will be involved with the upcoming uh, two year project at Sutton Who, which I cannot blame in way. Obviously, this isn't linked to Forestry England. This is Time Team. Yeah. But I, uh, I sort of the first time since 1970s that anyone's been out there doing any substantial investigations, some incredible geophysical, yeah. geophysical results to be explored. And uh, yeah, I feel very, very privileged to watch this space. Okay, so uh, then we've got a question from Tegan, which is which is a really lovely question. What employment is available in the area of archaeology other than the obvious roles of actually being an archaeologist and digging? So in, in general in archaeology, well, I mean, the obvious um, answer to this is to go to careerinruins.com and listen to the back catalogue of arguably one of the best podcasts there is out there. Shameless, I'm sorry. But um, no, I, it's a massively, massively poor profession, you will know, Neil. And um, yeah, I, I, as important and as great as digging is, there's some fantastic books that are far, far removed from that. That digging circuit and, and commercial archaeology. And if, if you want to find out more, either go to the Council of British Archaeologists resource pages, uh, archaeology resource pages, or um, yeah, check out our back catalog. We've got 50 podcasts of every different type of archaeology and sort of environment that there is relevant. Yeah, brilliant. That's really that's really great advice. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so one one simple question then there, then then there's a a really interesting uh, philosophical question that we're going to we're going to pose to you so um given that so many of your sites are scheduled if there was one site you would allow to you were allowed to excavate which would it be and this is from the digging gardener i'm really intrigued i really like their name oh it's a great question it's a great question um Oh, I've never really thought about it. I, I'll tell you the sites I love, and they're the um, Roman Pickwick Kilns. I'd love to go and revisit some of the um, uh, Pickwick Kilns in Slogan, the New Forest, and in um, Ice Hope. Um, that'll bring with it a lot of post-exodus. That's a pretty nice touch. So they, 
maybe but one of the uh square the iron square barrows up in yorkshire they are just the most beautifully enigmatic little things and the potential that comes with them as well is is yeah pretty exciting and obviously we all know that a good square barrow has the potential for having a chariot inside it so it's really actually what you're after isn't it <laughs> But none of us do, so no one should go around fertling around. Uh, we don't. We, we don't. Know. Well, there's plenty in Yorkshire to go and have a look at, honestly. Um, uh, but really exciting. OK, so last, last two questions. Um, one is from Roger. And then we've got uh, a sort of a question in three parts from Katie Whitaker. So this is actually Katie Sarsons Whitaker, uh, uh, who we know really well. But Roger asked, is vegetation clear clearance always the best way to protect an ancient monument? Can vegetation provide? Absolutely, yeah, brilliant question. And so obviously we need to be prescriptive to our sites. It's not binary, it's not one, one shape fits all. So often things like linear, um, these Anglo-Saxon boundary banks that we have, for example, running through a number of our forests, they can be running for three kilometers or more. And um, by removing trees off of these, what we're doing is opening them up to um, to other things like bracken and bramble and regeneration. So by retaining so westwards, for example, in, in Katie's site, by retaining the beech trees close to, not on or if on monitored, um, close to these features, which is at odds with things like the UK forestry standard requirements, what those those broad leaves are doing is, is suppressing the vegetation, the regeneration. And protecting that monument, so um, it's horses for courses. And in some instances, we won't we won't clear our sites, but in other instances, and um, other instances, we will, and it'll have positive impacts to, to the natural environment. So. Yeah, brilliant. Thank thank you very much. Uh, so the la last question uh, that I'm going to do is from, from Katie. And obviously, Katie knows woodland well because she she likes exploring them to find her sarsens. But you know, there is a real difference in, in the way we want to manage the woodland estate now the forestry estate and she asked what sort of inno innovations and solutions are you starting to explore to do this more effectively so things like the environment agency i diary is obviously revolutionizing our understanding and our, our applications and katie, no one like katie, katie will know that better than anyone else having done some some work for us in westwoods as well and a very complicated um archaeological landscape um drone technology um just last year, and there'll be, keep your eyes peeled, there'll be a time team special on this at some point, but we were looking at the use of drone-based LIDAR with Adam Stanford from SUMO and Stuart Ainsworth, and we were looking, so we went to Wycombe, where we bought with square barrows, hugely dense archaeological um, area, um, with an area, with the, with the forest itself being looked at, at, removing some of the coniferous plantations, changing its rotation, bringing in a bit more of a, of a mixed woodland cover. Um, and the question was, is there potential for more previously unknown archaeology that, that wasn't mapped at the time of the plantation? So no, no LIDAR there because of the dales, but we can get a drone up with a LIDAR pod and we've been looking at how we can apply um, higher resolution LIDAR recording in, in, the, in significant areas, which is, which is quite cool as well. Brilliant. Right. I, I promise you this is going to be the very last question, but this one's just slipped into the chat. But I know, I know it's a question you'll enjoy. But I'm going to add one on. So Jane asks, do you have any D-Day landing camps in your forest? And what I want to just add to that, Lawrence, how can people find out what else is on Forestry Commission land? Do you have your own historic environment re record that people can actually access and search? Or are there other ways that they can actually find out more information? So I'll answer you on first it's easier. Um, in the, there's no centralised website at the moment. It's, it's about site-specific web pages and whatnot, but obviously being like heritage gateways and regional and county records and um, online services or all um, any practical maps where they're there will um will give you a bit of an insight into what's there. I'm hoping that in the coming years that will improve. But it, so today I should say the historic environment has always been a constraint to forestry commission. It's something we avoid and it stops us from doing what we need to do. But actually what we what we are starting to do is look at the opportunities that we historic environment has to offer and that will be looking at promotion and sharing and and, and um educating so that that will improve i think in the coming years but for now um if, you, if it's a specific site there may be dedicated websites but otherwise um search search google with the google region yeah. Yeah. um with regards to d-day camps yes we do um there is one in on in project 
72, if you Google that. Uh, but also there's plenty in the new forest now. I know there are people like Richard Greens and me, being thinking of me, James Brown on the call, uh, screening at me right now, going, there's loads in the new forest, and you were there for eight years, and you should know it all. It, 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 you're right richard reeves has just said pen penalty camps are already for you okay you so yeah richard's been keeping you <laughs> on the straight and narrow in the chat as well so thanks <laughs> thanks for that richard <laughs> yeah we're, we're, we're a close family and we all like each other which is absolutely fantastic lawrence i'm going to stop you there i'm just going to say a huge huge thank you we we could talk for absolutely hours given how how interesting how interesting the forests are and, and just the subject matter you've actually got. So everyone else, if you've enjoyed tonight's lecture, please do consider making a donation to the CBA to help us continue to offer events like this. There will be a link in the chat that you can go to, but we will also be sending you a short uh, questionnaire that we'd be really delighted if you could fill out so that um, we can just actually make these events and activities a little bit better. Um, and of course, you can go onto the CBA website where you can find a host of links and activities that you can actually take part in and other ways that you can support the work we do. I am delighted to say that the next This Is Archaeology lectures, uh, we're in lecture in the lecture series will be Dispatches from Beneath the Peat Fen, Must Farm and Other Deeply Buried Prehistories with Mark Knight from Cambridge University's Archaeological Unit. This will be on the evening of Thursday, the 18th of April. Uh, details will be in the link and there'll be more on the CBA website. But um, if you've if you've noticed any of the press recently, the Must Farm books have now been written and published and are out. And we're absolutely delighted that Mark Knight, who led the excavations at Must Farm, is going to come and talk to us about um, how their knowledge of the sites developed since they actually did the excavation. So... That's one not to miss on the 18th of April. Um, but for now, I'd like to thank you all for taking part. I would like to thank Lawrence especially. That was fantastic. Um, we will definitely get you back, but but in a time team uh, uh, hat on to talk about um, uh, everything that you actually end up doing over, over in East Anglia um, at Sutton Hoo, which sounds absolutely fantastic. But for now, I thank everybody and thank Lawrence and a good night.